Hi, I'm Michael Killen. There's great interest today around the world about the development of climate change, and some people say there's nothing to it. Others say there is something to it. And there is great interest in creating jobs and preparing people to find new jobs. I have invited a fellow named John Perkins. He is a professor emeritus from Evergreen College. Also, he is a member of the National Council for Science and the Environment. I'm going to ask him a series of questions about climate change, the environment, the term green. I'm going to challenge him why he says climate change is a reality. I'm going to ask him questions about how the education system is developing in the United States and how it should develop with respect to issues like engineering, uh, energy, and its relationship to jobs. John, how are you? I'm very fine. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for joining me here. Thanks for having me. And John, I I'd like to know, where did this term green, the green economy, green jobs, green food, where did that come from? You know, I'm not sure I can tell you exactly who invented it, but um, uh, it, it was sometime in the 1980s, 1990s, that I think green increasingly became the, the sort of the shorthand to say, well, if it's green, it's environmentally good. If it's not green, it's not environmentally good. Okay. And, you know, I, I remember chatting with you, and you also said uh, Harry Truman, a president in 1949, 1950, uh, had a role to play in creating that term. Well, I in a way, he did. Um, although I don't think that's what President Truman wanted to do. Uh, but he started the initiative which brought about what's called the Green Revolution, which is very high-yielding agriculture. And he did it for national security reasons, and it wasn't until many years later it was called the Green Revolution. Why would he uh, promote high-yield crops for a national security reason? Uh, it was actually pretty simple. Uh, there was great fear that if countries could not raise more food, they would have red revolutions. And what became the Green Revolution was to forestall red revolutions. Okay, we have some viewers who might not pick up on what red means, but when you and I were younger... That uh, meant communists. Communists, and yeah. countries that were not economically successful, we might tend to fall under the influence of the communists. That's right. And that was a competition to us Americans and Western Europe and some other parts of the country with respect to uh, democratic yes. and capitalism. That's right. Okay. Yes. It, this was when the United States started its Cold War with the Soviet Union. And it lasted from 1940, uh, 1949 till 1989. So with agriculture, we went green to stop the Reds. That's right. Okay, what about the term sustainability? When did that enter our lexicon? That has a much more easily defined point. About 1986, a United Nations report um, uh, came out and called for sustainable development. It meant that you had to help people get wealthier in order to protect the environment. And you had to help people get wealthier to protect the environment. How, right. how, I don't get that. The, the, the theory was, and I think it's true, I, I, for everything I can see makes it true, uh, was that if people remained poor, they would not take the steps needed to protect the environment. They had to get wealthy to protect the environment. So this is a report that was concerned with the environment. That's right. And one solution was to help encourage people to get wealthy, get right. money, so they could protect the environment. Right. When a and it went the other way, too. If they didn't protect the environment, they couldn't get wealthy. So the, the two were joined at the hip. So it's an equilibrium. Yes. And the word sustainability sort of means equilibrium. Uh, yes. Is that right? Well, it, it, it usually means uh, that there's economic development, 
there's environmental protection, and there's equity. And if you don't have the three going together, you know, there's got to be some sort of equality among people. You can't have very poor people and very rich people. That is unstable, and the environment will be not protected. Okay, so the key pillars of su su sustainability are, would you say it again? Equity. Equity. Economics. And economics. And environment. What's equity? Equity means uh, not that everybody is exactly equal, but we don't have huge disparities with some people not having housing, health care, clean water. Everybody needs housing, health care, clean water, and education. And of course, there'll always be some difference in income. But the notion was you had to raise the poorest of the people in the world to a higher level. And this was also part of uh, uh, forestalling uh, communist revolution. Really? So su sustainability was an outgrowth in part from the competitive influence of the communists. I think so, yes. In interesting. Yes. Because the people who coined the term came largely from Western Europe and the United States, the, the capitalist countries of the world, and they thought this was a better way to go. And that was, of course, the whole motive of the Cold War. Now, I know you've written a couple of books. Uh, you could just have the names of them so we know sure, who they're, you are. They're, they're kind of long names, but uh, one was called Insects, Experts in the Insecticide Crisis which dealt with uh, the problems of DDT and why did we use so many insecticides, what was Rachel Carson's Silent Spring really all about. Uh, the second was called Geopolitics and the Green Revolution. Okay, so one's about ants and bugs and insecticides, okay, little stuff, and the other is big issues, global uh, issues. And, and about things. crops, uh, particularly wheat and rice. Okay, that's in the first book. That's in the, the geopolitics oh, the book. the geopolitics. Yeah. And that's the big issue because a lot of people need wheat. Yes. A lot of people need rice. Yes. Fundamentals, something yeah. like that. But, you know, I'm still, I'd like to know this. You've been a professor, so you've thought hard about how to educate people, right? And if you look out at the United States, 300 and something million people, um, isn't is it easy or difficult for all of the people out there to understand the significance of climate change? It's easy, but the educational institutions don't help people understand it. The really basic parts of climate change aren't all that difficult. But wait, you just said the educational institutions, and I can include not just colleges, universities, but I can elementary schools. Yes. You're saying the education system has not pre helped prepare the populace to understand it. That's right. And if that's the case, the citizens are not prepared to understand it. That's, I believe that's, that's true, that, uh, that the educational institutions have not helped people get enough scientific understanding so they can understand the fairly simple arguments about why climate change is a real threat. So, if we have viewers out there, and if their education is inept and poor, of course they can't grab onto a concept like climate change. But maybe okay. you could share with us some fundamentals, some insights that would help all of us gain a better understanding of it. Well, let me give the most simple example. Uh, everybody knows the sun comes up in the morning. The sunshine comes into the earth, and it hits the earth. It gets absorbed, and it warms the earth. At night, the sun goes down, and that warmth of the earth radiates back into space, and that's what keeps the earth on a fairly even temperature. But there are some gases, like carbon dioxide, that if those gases build into the atmosphere to too high a level, then when the Earth tries to radiate heat back into space, those gases will absorb that heat and keep it in the atmosphere. What's wrong with that? Well, um, if there's too much carbon dioxide, there's too much heat that's kept in, and the Earth's climate gets much, much warmer with disruptions of agriculture and uh, disruptions of uh, water, 
precipitation, rain, and uh, we're, we have a way of living where we understand how to do agriculture in a particular climate. If the climate change comes, then our agricultural systems are put in danger. And it seems counterintuitive, but a small amount of extra carbon dioxide, extra compared to what's naturally there, can start to make big differences in temperature over uh, quite a, a few decades. We're not talking about something that's going to happen tomorrow, but we are going to have something that when I think of my grandchildren, they're going to have to deal with this. All right. Can I go back to the sun comes up in the morning? Sure. It comes down, it hits the earth, it heats the earth, and then the sun goes down, and then in the evening, the earth radiates the heat. Yeah. And before we came on the planet, you know, humans, a lot of it went straight out to space. Right. Right. And yes, volcanoes and trees rotting, I guess, have put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Just tell me how bit long is the atmosphere? What is the distance from the Earth to approximately seven miles? Uh, approximately. Once you get up seven miles, there's not a whole lot of atmosphere left. Okay, so the definition of the atmosphere is really that area of air and other gases? Well, the atmosphere that we depend on most is that closest to the Earth. Mm -hmm. Now, you can find some that goes out 50, 100 miles, but it's much lower. Okay, so as carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere, instead of the heat going off, it gets stuck here. That's right, yeah. And just a little change disrupts the climate, and a little bit is okay, but if the Sierras melt a month or two ahead of time, or snow doesn't fall there at all, it wipes out the entire agricultural the That's food right. system that, that feeds part of the world and us. Okay. That's right, yes. All right. And now, you know, there's a lot of disputes about and forgive me, you scientists came up with this scheme about climate change because you want to control us. Well, like, are you the controlling type? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Uh, but you know, this is, this is uh, to me, it's kind of a funny thing because uh, I was trained in the sciences. And when I see scientists in operation, I see people who are trying to solve puzzles, trying to solve problems. And most scientists really aren't particularly interested in controlling other people. But what science came up with was two things that are really important. One is carbon dioxide and a few other gases like water vapor are natural constituents of the atmosphere. And they make the Earth at a temperature that's very good for us. The problem comes if we get extra carbon dioxide, then the atmosphere heats a little more. And that's not going to be good for us because it will disrupt the climate patterns that we are used to. Okay, that's good. We're going to go on another topic in a moment, but I just want to say, behind you, I know folks watch this show every week and, and they probably wonder what's behind you. That's a painting I make called Climate Change for the Rest of Us. And I depict people falling out of, pl out of the sky, because that can happen, and I depict uh, person being washed away by a wave and and some of us are going to fry like sunny side up eggs which I put on, on that uh -huh. painting as the breast of a person. But now I'd like to ask you, um, you, you mentioned the education system of the United States has not prepared the citizens for the kind of economy that we're in and the future. And I believe you are working on trying to encourage the colleges and universities to add a new focus, the teaching of energy. Right. Did I articulate that right? Yes, yes. I've, I've